everyone. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute. If anyone has any uh, questions in particular about security APIs in cloud native environments, now's the perfect time to uh, put them in chat so that we're ready to go in for about yes, here. Uh, I think he's just having a few uh, last minute pitches. He'll be joining the, um, the round table in a second. Hi, Mark. Sorry, I had some audio issues. Got connected there. Great to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, let's get started. So, my name is Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns in him. And I'm here as your moderator for this session. We're going to be talking about securing APIs in the cloud native environments. Prof, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role? Yeah, uh, so I'm Prabhat Sirvadana. Uh, so I've been with WSO2 for uh, like last uh, almost 14 years and uh, mostly leading uh, the WSO2 identity server and also uh, leading uh, the security architecture of uh, across uh, all the other WSO2 products. environments like what I know it's oh, 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 oh. you should think about them again those uh, core elements. yes uh, I think the very uh, first element uh, would be like uh, you need to know your audience first uh, who you are developing, you are uh, more than developing like uh, who is going to access your APIs and uh, who is going to access your uh, microservices. So know the audience first. And and then uh, once you know the audience, uh, you need to uh, worry about few things. You need to uh, worry about uh, how you uh, authenticate uh, users. And most of the time, uh, the API access, it can be a system that directly access an API or else it can be a system that is accessing an API on behalf of another system or on behalf of a, a human user. So that uh, like having an understanding about uh, audience uh, first will be helpful. Then we need to see how you can uh, enforce uh, the security controls. For example, you would need to know uh, what authentication mechanisms you need to follow, like how to authenticate a system if it is accessing uh, just by being itself, or how to authenticate system it's accessing on behalf of another system or on behalf of another user. And then you need to worry about uh, how you uh, in policies or uh, do authorization. Uh, so when, uh, uh, when in terms of authorization, you should worry about uh, where to enforce it, Speci especially in a microservices deployment, it can be enforced at multiple levels. You can enforce it at the, the gateway level, probably like co screen policies can be done at the gateway level. That will be the entry point for your uh, API or microservice deployment. Then you can <coughs> do uh, uh, policy enforcement at your service level. Like if you're family with like service mesh architecture, it can be at your proxy. Then uh, certain like the fine grain policies, like service specific policies can be enforced at the uh, proxy level. And still uh, there can be certain authorization policies or uh, data level entitlements probably will go into your application level as well. But still, even though you you need certain uh, like entitlement uh, policies at the application level, you need to see how much you can externalize that. So after that, you also need to think about how you how you transport data in a secure manner, like uh, where to enforce encryption and to what level, whether you do it at the transport layer at or at the message level, and then how you how you protect the integrity of the messages you've been passed 
and also these messages can be like uh, when you especially talking uh, among services it can be the user context it can be the uh, business messages that you transport th these entities so those things uh, you need to worry about and yes so you need to first have understanding with audience and then uh, worry about the security controls and then how to enforce them some apologies for stepping off to reboot and back now so uh thanks for taking that through uh, and sorry to miss a couple of minutes of it. But so then you're you're constantly working with businesses around um, building their robust security systems. What are some of the most common risks that you're seeing emerge at the moment? Or are, are there any current trends as far as particular ways uh, people are trying to look for vulnerabilities in cloud native um, infrastructures? Yeah, the... I think the 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 major risk uh, that I I find uh, in like most of these cloud native deployments, uh, people uh, uh, don't worry about security first place. Uh, like they don't think about security at the very design 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 phase. They think it's something that you can bring in later. Uh, and and most of the microservices deployment, like we started talking about microservices deployment like some years back, right? So then like last three, four years, we have seen this is becoming a reality, right? So we have seen large scale microservices deployment. Like, so we have hear about like uh, microservices deployments of thousands right, of, of services. So complexity of having these services, like so you have a lot of like services interactions then security becomes very complex. So most of the time what we have seen is People, uh, people worry about edge security. So, like, so whenever a request comes into your Microsoft deployment, so that that will be handled by a gateway. So you terminate that connection, and then from there onwards, you think it's it's a trusted environment. You don't worry about security in that environment. Like service service interactions, you probably uh, like uh, rely on TLS and in some cases MTLS, and that's it. So that's that's an anti pattern we see. Uh, so you basically trust the network. So we are moving away from this uh, trust the network pattern and go to zero trust zero trust network pattern. So when you when you go to the zero trust network pattern, you keep no or minimal trust on the network. So if you don't trust the network, then what can we do? We need to make sure all the messages that we receive should be checked for security at as much as close to the resource. So that's where this service mesh pattern comes into play. So with service mesh pattern, each each endpoint, each service has its own proxy, right? So each proxy will do its security validation. So you won't trust the network. Of course, network level measures will be there, TLS, MTLS would be there, but still at each each uh, proxy level before the message being dispatched to the corresponding service, you need to make sure uh, the the proper security controls being uh, addressed. So you you need to think about using JWT. And then again, like, so we see um, uh, like misuse of JWTs, you need to have like proper understanding how you want to use JWT. Uh, so yes, yeah, so so basically why people don't worry about security at the initial stages, we have seen it's it's a little complex, right? Because of that, they just rely on TLS, but over the time, last two years, we have seen a lot of improvement with Istio, with Kubernetes, and with uh, like uh, OPA, then Spiffy projects, so a lot of improvements been happening and 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 like probably in, I, I would assume in six months to one year. So we'll see a lot of improvements in like automating these security controls into environment. Like for example, Istio. Istio supports MTLS by default now. Uh, Linkerd supports MTLS by default. Like you don't need to do anything by default when you dis, uh, dispatch a service, uh, deploy a service with Istio or Linkerd, you can make sure that it's it's secured with MTLS. So we'll see a lot of improvements happening and and complexity being like uh, being reduced uh, in the security domain. So I mean, you talk about security being one of those things that's introduced later on, and no one's thinking at the design stage. I mean, and that's because traditionally, these the people building don't want to be held up by someone telling them, no, 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 you can't do that, or you've got to go slower, or whatever. So they sort of leave it to the last minute and then they ask security and then it turns out they haven't baked it in from the beginning. But like zero trust seems to get around that because if you're building your, you can build zero trust in from the beginning, it doesn't need to slow down your velocity of development, uh, but it's making sure that 
there's strict access and permission control. So it's it's going to be a more robust design. Is that is that how exactly. that pattern works? Yes, exactly. Yes. The, the one reason is like, so when you start a project, so you, you have tight deadlines, so you mostly focus on the functional requirements, right? So security being a non-functional requirements, you take it to the end. But as you said, yes, so, so that's once again, the beauty of the zero trust network pattern as old as, 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 as uh, defined in the, the Microsoft security principles as well, right? So separation of concern. So security becomes a, a different concern than the business requirements. That's where like, so developers can focus on building their microservices. Then like if you follow the service mesh pattern, so the proxy will take control of applying security, but you need to have the right environment, right? So right environment setup, right tooling. So you, that's right. You need to think about at the design stage, what you need to do is think about the tooling infrastructure and how you want to build the security. Right, so uh, like we are, what level of granularity we need to enforce access control policies? Where do we enforce this access control policies? What tools we use? How do we like, so if you take certificates, so just having certificates is not enough. There should be a policy and tools to renew these certificates, right? If you take uh, Netflix, for example, in the Netflix microservices deployment, they use MTLS to protect service service communication and they renew certificates in every four minutes. So those are like short lived certificates. So you need to assess the risk and then again, uh, then come up with a tool set to accommodate those needs. And I think MTLS now is a field in open API specifications. So you can even set from the very get go, you can say yeah. how, like, you know, how often there is yeah. that um, renewal of certificates in your API specification. Is that right? That, that's right. And then again, the tool set should, should support that too. Yeah. Right. Cause then it's all you're building in the right automation for that sort of. Yeah. Um, so that's approach. what yeah. we are seeing too. Like for example, uh, the, uh, uh, so for like, for example, the people call that Kubernetes is an operating system, right? Kubernetes equal to Linux, right? But I, I don't think it's there yet. The, the reason is if Kubernetes is equal to Linux, right? application developers should not be talking about Kubernetes that much, but still we see a lot of people talking about Kubernetes, right? Like people don't talk about Linux, like people build applications because there's a good level of abstraction built on top of Linux where people can build applications. So we see a lot of people, a lot of initiatives coming up to build that abstraction of Kubernetes. So developers don't need to worry about Kubernetes. They can just focus on business searching. Same will apply to security. So if you take, for example, WSO2, our like Corio platform that we launched recently, so it start to some level try to uh, to try to address that particular concern. You don't need to worry about the underneath constructs. We'll provide you an opinionated view how you can do things. So you just focus on application logic. So same thing will be applicable for uh, like uh, security, and we'll see a lot of tooling and platforms will come to like fill that uh, vacuum. Um, the, you can see the evolution, how that's going to keep going then. Thanks. The So one of the other questions that came through from um, a workshop, oh, for a roundtable registration was, any do you have any particular hints and tips around how do you handle DD, DDoS attacks? Or is there any particular way that you use so, uh, design patterns to address that? What do you recommend? Yes, handling DDoS attack uh, at the application level is very tricky, right? So one basic thing that you can do is try to, not just for DDoS, but even for those or as a best practice, try to reject messages as much as closer to its origin, right? So that's a very basic principle. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, you can enforce certain, certain controls at the gateway level right to to reject messages that you don't need and you can do it at multiple levels too but do it as much as close to the origin so to prevent ddos it's not something like an individual can fight right uh, there has to be things that 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 like so machine learning needs to come in to identify that it's, an, it's a ddos attack so most of the time you will go for like cloud based solutions like uh, the akamai so uh, yeah, so Akamai and um, and and some other cloud-based solutions, right? Uh, to even AWS provide that, Azure provides that, uh, and do that at the CDN level itself. So when you can enforce at a CDN level, so whenever I send a, a request, 
it will directly go to the uh, uh, CDN closer to MEEP. So if I dispatch an API and if it is a certain uh, request coming through a CDN, so you can enforce DDoS attack with CDN level itself. Then your service won't get hit. So, so if you are protecting, like think about DDoS prevention, try to do it at the top level and go with uh, like network, the cloud-based uh, DDoS protection layer. And then, thanks. I was just checking the um, other uh, questions that came in on uh, the from the registrations. What's the biggest mistake you see being made in API design configuration and configuration from a security perspective? Yes. So API uh, design. Uh, so once again. Uh, so there are certain stuff highlighted in uh, the uh, OWASP top 10 API security uh, list. And so you would need to go through that, like how you validate messages, uh, then uh, how you how you uh, rely on certain parameters uh, without doing access control checks. I can give one example, right? Say, uh, say you have an API, right? Which accepts, uh, 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 which, which accepts a username, user ID and return its profile. Right. Say uh, so. I I log into a website uh, through Facebook. Then uh, let's say Facebook doesn't have this API. Let's say Facebook has this particular API except for user ID. Right. So then it will return back the your user ID. You pass the logged in user ID. Return it back. Ideally, if the API is designed just to return the logged in user's profile, it shouldn't accept a user ID. Right. It it is a point that access will look in. They will think, okay, let me try. I log in, I get a token, but I'll try to use someone else's use ID, and try to get it. Right. <clears throat> so ideally, you should have something like uh, like Facebook has this graph.facebook.com/me. Right. So then always the API implementation identify who the user is by looking at the token. That's one thing. So also another one is the use ID. So when you not just a use ID, any identifier. It shouldn't be like something guessable, right? So like it shouldn't be a sequence, like so one, two, three, four, like that. So then you would know, okay, so this works for me. So let me try something else. So probably you can go for a UUID thing, right? So make it harder. So there are certain stuff like that, like we have seen people not worrying about that. The best thing is how look at the, the, the API uh, top 10, like OWASP uh, top 10 API security list. So it'll help you understand like uh, what are the common uh, mistakes people do when designing APIs and uh, the steps to mitigate them. And what about like with um, uh, storing API keys and the encryption of API keys? We heard, <clears throat> excuse me, in the um, opening keynote keynote today, we heard that one example where um, the first time someone uses the API, they store the password or the use of the API key and then that's how that in future that it's all it's actually in the code base then for to, for, to enable future access how, yeah, how, yes. how, how what's how do you prevent that from being from happening or how do you build so that that's not one of your risks Sure. Yeah. So let me talk about that uh, uh, with respect to single page apps. So that's where we see this mostly right so uh, how you store these tokens? So single page apps is uh, is is a public client, right? So anything that you put on a single page apps, so JavaScript, it's visible to the end user, right? So uh, so when you log into a single page app, so probably use OpenID Connect, then you need to use the tokens that coming with OpenID Connect flow to access APIs. So what typically people do is you get the access token and refresh token, and you store it in either session storage or local storage, so you can consume it later, right? But so most of these patterns are, are vulnerable. Like if someone uh, like can inject a JavaScript to a website, so they can read the this local storage and session storage and find out the keys and send it somewhere else. Right. So best way to do that is use a web worker thread. So that's a that's the best security pattern. So if you want to store anything, use like if you want to initiate a login flow, do it through a, a web, web worker thread. And then you get a token and store it in the browser memory, which is under that particular web worker thread. So then only the JavaScript that 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 uh, uh, created that thread can access that uh, token stored in the memory. No one else can access. So you need to see like best practices and, and follow them. And especially we see some people even commit these keys to GitHub, right? 
and even even it's not good like people think okay this is fine it's a private github repo right but still you shouldn't do that it, it is in memory and it's going to history right so yeah so those are the best pattern you should follow and and once again you can see right so github doing a lot of they are building a lot of security tooling around that so they detect like even not level the code level this token stuff they detect this stuff and inform the repository owner saying so there's a vulnerability so you should you should like make sure that you have the right level of security controls and just that the beauty of security is it, it has to be multi-layered you you like even though you have one policy you cannot assume safely assume that nobody will break that so always you need to have certain policy to validate it and keep validating that so you have, have the right like first you need to have a github hook like saying these these uh, people cannot commit these credentials right then again you need to have some scanning tools to scan your report to see whether somebody has like committed somehow that inform that so security is like continuous process and it won't never end yeah it will never end question thanks we also had a question about is there a difference between the level of security that you manage for when you've got public apis um, versus when you've got private APIs. But then let's take that a, a step further. Is, is there a, should you still treat your public APIs securely if you don't think there is any, um, if you're not exposing any specific, if you're just exposing like a product catalog uh, data or something like that? Like, do you need to worry about security in those ones if you think that they're low risk or, but is there is there a high, is there opportunity for um, malicious attacks to come in via those sorts of public APIs? Yeah, of course, of course there is. So one one uh, uh, so public APIs are more critical than private APIs. Especially we talk about DDoS, right? So if you have any public API, so you need to worry about how you can mitigate or prevent DDoS attacks happening, and you need to have the right measures. Like if that happens, or to mitigate that, right? So that that's that's one thing. Once again, then uh, the audience of the public API is complex. So so once again, we have seen uh, secured public APIs as well as anonymous public APIs, right? So we need to think about that. Like Twitter, for example, some time back they had uh, public APIs, anonymous public APIs, without authenticating that you can just invoke public APIs. But later they removed that for any Twitter API now. So that's that's secured. So there has to be some credentials. But once again, it's a tricky area. Like uh, it's not just the legitimate, uh, the, the concern is not, it's a legitimate user accessing it, but also people can misuse it. So I can give an example. Let's say uh, uh, I have a mobile app, right? So uh, where you can like take for example, stop up, right? Stop up, you can see the movie tickets, those stuff, right? So so they have an API, even, even before I logged in the system, I can see what are the available movie tickets, right? So only when I want to buy, I need to log in, right? So now probably maybe this is not how StubHub actually works. I'm just saying like hypothetical example. Uh, so they may get revenue by displaying ads based on the movies for the anonymous users, right? And to get this movie list, uh, you need to invoke an API and that the, the keys to access that API is embedded in the application. So anyone having root level access to a mobile app, you can find the keys. The issue here is, so it's an anonymous API, we don't worry who invokes it. The issue is I can steal those keys and create another app similar to StubHub app or any, any kind of app, right? Then the, the, the legitimate users can log into my app and consume this service. But what happens? The ad revenue comes to me. I can decide what to display, right? So that is a misuse of the API. So how to prevent that? It's very tricky because those are public clients. So what we need to do is we need to make sure only our clients can access the particular API. So there are no straightforward ways to fix that. We can make it harder. Like we can provide like custom headers, provide some set of like signing, but still, if you are a like real hacker, you can get those details because we keep all this in the, the client side. So one way to prevent that is use other measures like machine learning, identify the user behaviors. So based on that, you can block the traffic like getting the complete context of the environment. Yep. Okay, my apologies, but I have to leave us there because um, we've got another uh, 
we've got another another round table to head to. Um, but thanks so much. You, WSO2 has a, um, a table at the Expo, so I'm sure that they can follow up with you there. But thanks very much, Prabhat, for a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks.